So um, I am gonna talk with you today about something that I'm very passionate about and a lot of my patients have struggled with benzodiazepines, either um, trying to uh, understand what's going on, why they're seeming to stop working or trying to get off of them. And so it's a really important talk uh, for everybody to understand those of you that are prescribers or work in the treatment field. And of course, patients that are often bewildered by the whole thing. That's a, this is a prescribable medicine that's been around for a long time. So we're gonna call these medicines benzodiazepine receptor agonist, BZRAs is how we're going to start referring to them because it's not just those that fall into the class of benzodiazepines, it's all and so BZRAs. Um, so that includes medicines like um, alprazolam, which is Xanax and chlordiazepoxide, which is Librium, clonazepam. These are the most common ones that you've heard of, which is clonopin, diazepam, Valium, lorazepam is Ativan and more. And then the Z drugs, these are the, um, the generic names, but they are Ambien, Sonata, and Lunesta. So those are all the category of BZRAs. So the thing that we know is a lot of people have some trouble with BZRAs. I'm an addiction specialist and I am really good at taking people off of medication or drugs, mostly drugs, but also medication. But people that have BZRA or benzodiazepine related problems, it's really related to a physiological dependence. There might be comorbid addiction to something else, but most people don't have addiction to benzos when they're suffering through these things that we're gonna talk about. It's actually physiological dependence, not addiction. So, all right, um, the thing is, what we, what we know is that when we take something, so benzo works in certain pathways, both in the, in the physical, in the, in the peripheral body, the muscle, musculoskeletal, the smooth muscle, it works there. It also works in the brain and it works um, in, the, in different pathways, but um, in the GABA and glutamate system. And as you use, so there's something underlying sensitization, kindling, as you use something, regularly and ongoing, particularly something that has physiological dependence and withdrawal. It changes the chemistry. It makes, it, makes every, those, those, sen those receptors more sensitive, basically called kindling, so making there be more receptors. And so over time, as we take benzos, now I'm talking about daily benzo use over time. I'm not talking about um, taking an Ativan once a week for five years for a panic attack. I'm talking about daily benzo, some people taking three times a day, five times a day, usually as prescribed by a doctor. Um, we end up having depression, something called discognition, which you know what that means, decreased cognition. There's some data that suggests that dementia is related to ongoing regular use of benzodiazepines or BCRAs. Addiction is a rare, uh, but there are some studies about that. And then even though benzos are typically used to treat anxiety, we see loads of studies showing that even with ongoing benzo use, anxiety gets worse and worse and worse, even um, leading to things like agoraphobia increased neurological symptoms, neurological, physical, <clears throat> peripheral, and then also seizure disorder, persistent withdrawal injury. So, you know, in my world, the simple <clears throat> prescribers might say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if you're, if you're coming to me, I'm a psychiatrist, I specialize in addiction medicine. <clears throat> if you're coming to me and things are good, then why change anything? Well, we would change something for preventive measures, certainly. But usually people come to me and they're on a benzo and, excuse me, and they're still having anxiety and then they're having additional depression and they're having even more things like hyper anxiogenesis. So that means like there's more anxiety. And so the benzodiazepines, they lose efficiency and efficacy over time in some, not everybody. I definitely will continue benzodiazepines for a certain subclass of subset of patients because of the uh, particular 
uh, symptoms or if it's working or they have some other certain things that are very specific. So we can't assume that the adverse reactions are new symptoms. So if someone's been on a benzodiazepine for a decent amount of time, and then they start having more anxiety and also adding depression, also adding this discognition, memory problems, neurological problems, then we might actually be having an adverse reaction to the benzo, not necessarily a new onset depression. So one thing that primary care doctors do as a psychiatrist, I don't do this that well because I don't have the device to do this, but monitoring nocturnal oxygenation. And so what we find is that basically benzodiazepines decrease the respiratory rate and the respiratory system. And so if we find that you imagine if you just for whatever reason, you started having less and less oxygenation, oxygen in your system, really overloading your carbon dioxide and not, not getting enough flow, then you may have all of these symptoms, discognition, dementia. It really is a funky feeling for people to decrease their oxygenation. So if that's the case, then we can blame the benzo. So a typical um, duration of use for daily use for benzodiazepines is four weeks. That's what it was studied. That's what it was indicated for, for anxiety at the very uh, early onset when it was first FDA approved. They were first FDA approved, but there's rarely benefits seen beyond four weeks. Mostly it's patients that feel like they need more because they're having anxiogenesis. Let's see, get to the next slide. All right. So we're talking now about something that we're calling benzodiazepine or BZRA withdrawal and BZRA injury sy syndrome or symptoms. And so these are some of those symptoms. I mentioned, you know, some of the um, psychological symptoms, but these are the specifics. In the neurophysiological, some people have discontinuation when they start withdrawing and it causes an electric shock. Some people have this pain experience, like even in their muscles and in their periphery, but also stuff like centralized, just general weakness and pain. Some people have auditory and um, or olfactory and uh, visual hallucinations and disturbances. And then even I've seen people with what's like in Parkinson's, it's called cogwheel rigidity, where their um, muscles are so kind of um, tight and taut. Um, and then they might have pseudo seizures. So these are some of the symptoms. There's also some other um, somatic symptoms that we have seen. So when we remove the benzodiazepine, when, or when we start deprescribing and decreasing the benzodiazepine, people think that they're having resurging anxiety and so they need the benzo again. What's happening is it's actually not, re, it is not re-emergent anxiety, although it feels like anxiety, but worse than it was before they started the benzo. It's probably benzodiazepine withdrawal. And so the psychological symptoms um, are not present before benzo initiation. So different people have, um, uh, so people have a different presentation. It also includes that neurophysiological and somatic symptoms. You get some GI uh, abnormalities, some gut uh, gastrointestinal issues, like I was talking about the movement abnormalities and pain. So, um, and then they, the, what's interesting about this is like, I deal with a lot of people with opiate withdrawal. Some of my colleagues here do too. And they, people coming off of opiates, the symptoms are very clear. It goes this, then this, then this, then this. And it goes in a wave, whether it might be extended, it might be short. But with benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome, um, it's waxing and waning. And so it's kind of different clusters of symptoms come up at different times during the withdrawal and deep prescribing. And so that makes it really hard for a clinician to identify unless we're able to spend a lot, a lot of time with a patient. It's very hard for a clinician to identify exactly what's what unless they're really well seasoned. So we have to like look at case by case basis. So there's different ways to do withdrawal symptom management. Of course, I highly recommend professionally directed um, that um, would be um, using non-pharmacological treatments. Um, I also recommend professionally directed pharmacological treatments. There's also the option to use self-directed treatment. And then there are some other non-pharmacological supplements and botanicals that we can talk about a little bit in the end. 
So the professionally directed um, non-pharmacological treatments are using tools such as cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, that's great, but it doesn't, you can't remove a seizure with CBT, right? So we need to make sure that we're also sometimes in tandem covering the withdrawal symptoms. You can cover some of the withdrawal symptoms with some devices such as an alpha stim, which is something that you wear in your ears and you're able to um, calm some of the sympathetic, the fight or flight that the benzo withdrawal comes with. Um, so it can calm that down, but not at a cellular level as deeply as some of the patients really need. So we might need to lean on medication. Um, we, we will need to lean on medication. Acceptance and commitment therapy is a nice type, is a great type of, um, of therapy. Acupuncture is, you know, a mind and body and very much uh, goes to a cellular level in a different philosophy, but very effective. And there's acupuncture just for the ear for withdrawal. And there's also whole body acupuncture. Massage therapy can help a lot of the symptoms that you may have from benzodiazepine withdrawal, but not all of them, particularly they can help some of the anxiety and help some of the muscular tension. Um, and neurofeedback is another thing, but again, we need to think about some of the professionally directed or non-professionally directed weaning down um, for benzodiazepine withdrawal. Some self-directed things that one can do um, to ameliorate some of the anxiety and some of the other things that may come about when someone's decreasing or stopping benzodiazepines. Things like exercise, movement, imagery, breath therapy. I didn't put breathing in here. Um, Mindfulness-based stress reduction is fantastic. And then spiritual interventions, certainly. But we did put relaxation and breathing interventions. And then biofeedback. Um, if anyone wants to get into some deep uh, breathing, breath work, and understanding, there's a great book called Breath that's been on the uh, best-selling list for a couple of months. And it is a journalistic look at different breathing techniques that can tremendously help folks with all different sorts of, of illnesses. It, I'm not giving this as medical advice. It's something that might augment the medical advice. Um, these are some symptom relief measures that one can take supplements and botanicals. And so we can use magnesium, L-theanine, different adaptogens, which are herbs that help the body balance everything out chamomile, lemon balm, kava, GABA, valerian, and acetal. And this, these will be on the website. So if you're wanting to look at this at another time, you can get a little, little information from this. And there's, there's information on different, um, different web pages about dosings for this. Um, and some of it's on WebMD. And then there's certainly some practitioners that have really great, um, there's tons more as well, but there's, these are kind of what I distilled down to the top, my top, nine. Um, and then let's talk about some pharmacological adjunctives to benzos or to, to benzo withdrawal or to it, to those that are off of benzos. So carbamazepine, which is an anti-epileptic and a mood stabilizer is the best because it has the best data. There's other, um, other medicines in that category that can be used instead of carbamazepine, such as valproic acid and topiramate and gabapentin that do have some data to both help with withdrawal from benzodiazepines and then also help with symptoms that may crop up after the long, after the bulk of the withdrawal is done. And then there's mixed data on these other medications and including CBD, which is not a medication, but available. So this is the, of course, something we always want to acknowledge because benzodiazepine survivors are, have been uh, very, very, um, uh, has, have suffered for some time and have gotten through it through diligence and vigor. Okay, so this is the benzodiazepine conversion table. I don't want to go into great detail about this, but I do want to mention that there is an algorithm. So if someone is taking diazepam 10 milligrams, let's say so a patient, a patient that I saw today, for example, let's go to, um, he's taking diazepam 10 milligrams twice a day. And so um, we would want to perhaps convert him to a different medication such as clonazepam, which is a little bit shorter, longer acting 
And so we would convert that to instead um, the one milligram of clonazepam. So it's kind of apples and oranges when people look at these doses because they think, some people think, oh, I'm taking 10 milligrams of diazepam, so then I should take the equivalent 10 milligrams of clonazepam. Absolutely not true. It's a little bit apples and oranges. These references down here, this reference that's um, the Ashton Manual, that's one really great resource for benzo, um, for benzodiazepine information and some really good tapers that are self-directed tapers that some patients have even brought to me so that I can help them with that. Um, it's, it, they're very long, sometimes many year long tapers. Um, here's more of the conversion. All right, so let's go back to what the risks are. We've talked somewhat about the risks are about benzos, but let's go back to those. Um, sedation, dizziness, vertigo, fatigue, all of these cognition issues that we talked about. We talked about the psychomotor impairment. And this is while people are taking benzos. This might be confusing because I maybe wasn't clear. Some of the, some of the pieces I was talking about before were benzo withdrawal. And now I'm talking about benzodiazepine use. And so these are some of the issues. They overlap greatly, which is interesting because you would think that if you're having withdrawal, it would be the opposite. Most things are the opposite of the intoxication or the use, but oftentimes this stuff overlaps. Here's some more um, risk fact, risks of taking benzodiazepines. The most important thing of this is, at least in, in my mindset, is as a, as a doctor that wants to keep people not just well, but also alive and well, right? The overall mortality um, of those taking benzodiazepines is markedly higher than those that are not taking benzodiazepines. Is that a chicken and egg phenomena? Perhaps, um, and we'll need more data on that to very specifically say if it's causing or correlated with. However, just know that the overall mortality for those with benzodiazepine regular use is much higher than those without. So, the tolerant benzodiazepine tolerance syndrome um, includes all of these psychological symptoms, these neurophysiological symptoms, and these somatic symptoms. And so we talked about this a little bit in the beginning. And so this is just a bit better breakdown. And so this is when someone is in withdrawal and coming down off of a benzodiazepine. Now that doesn't mean someone has stopped, let's say cold turkey. This may be someone for example, someone that I worked with last week, her, um, she was going from clonazepam, I want to say um, 0.5 milligrams three times a day to 0.5 milligrams in the morning, 0.5 in the afternoon, and 0.25 in the evening. So she was going down by um, one sixth of her dose. And she was having some of these, both the psychological symptoms of anxiety, the electric shock sensations some weird muscle fasciculations, meaning little spasms, <clears throat> of course, sleeplessness, and then also some nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So this can happen when you're decreasing, when you're deprescribing the benzo, or if someone's been taking it regularly, um, it can happen when you're um, coming off of it by accident because you've, you know, went on vacation and forgot it. All right, so this is, one of the ways that we do help people micro taper or, um, or um, go down on their dosing um, is they, we, we do a micro taper and I'm sorry, I'm having, a, we've got a storm going on here. So we just had a big old crack of lightning. So please forgive me for getting a little distracted. Um, so benzodiazepine micro taper is, um, it's challenging and I mean, I'm telling you, you have to, as a patient and a clinician, I like to work with the patient's families. I like to work with the patient's therapists. I like to work with a team because I see patients only once every couple of weeks to a couple of months. And this needs to be something that is very highly detailed and adhered to. So the micro tapering is challenging, especially at first. Sometimes we um, sometimes we'll use the Ashton manual because they have very specific um, guidelines with very good, good dosings. Um, there are some ways that we can use diazepam 
and then decrease. Many of the many of the benzodiazepines are actually in liquid form, and so we can decrease some of them by using a liquid. We can do very small decreases because, like I said, is what well I didn't say this yet, but what I learned in medical school and what some of my colleagues, you know, family practice, the American Academy of Family Practice, when it talks about decreasing and stopping benzos, they talk about cutting it by a quarter every day and then being done. That's great for some people, it really does work. But the people that we're talking about, the people that are here today, the people that are working with people that are struggling, that is not going to work for them. Like I said, my patient that we did a sixth a sixth decrease that was not working for her. So we need to do smaller decrease, but very small decrements. So sometimes a 10th, sometimes a 20th and some micro micro tapering, really hard to do. And it's like a full-time job. And I just, I'm so proud of patients that are able to do it and able to get through it because it's hard. And they also started with underlying anxiety for which this was actually the initial treatment that then then they got stuck on. Um, so benzodiazepine withdrawal and injury is we really do have some injury and we can have some of these symptoms weeks to months to years after being off of the benzodiazepine. And it really does look like a toxic injury. You know, this medicine, it was used initially for um, positive purposes to help somebody with, with their anxiety, usually, and some other things also, sometimes sleep, but it can cause some perilous events, such as the GABA system being like, just kind of whacked and not be able, being able to respond, the glutamate system, serotonin, serotonergic system, serotonin can get off kilter. And then um, out in the periphery, like I've been talking about, um, you can have some very significant, um, uh, musculoskeletal issues that come up after long times because of some stuff on the mitochondria related to how benzos act and also in the microglia. So these are some of the pictures um, that we look at in the lung, liver, spleen, kidney, brain. We have um, basically, you would call it a benzodiazepine receptor. Um, and so it's all over the place. We, it deals with immune system even and steroids and um, apoptosis, which is related to, to cancer, um, calcium channel modulation, mitochondrial respiration. So these peripheral, um, these peripheral benzodiazepine receptors, the ones that are outside the brain, um, are really involved in the adverse reaction. So they might explain withdrawal. Um, and what we're doing at the Alliance, at uh, what, what um, Hunter introduced us, um, University of Arizona and the Alliance are funding some research to answer some of these questions. Um, but what we know is that benzodiazepine survivors thousands and thousands and thousands of folks have come together through, thank goodness, like social media, the internet and organizations like ours. And they have um, been able to provide us with information about their experiences. And these are some of the experiences. A lot of doctors have been known to invalidate patients' feelings about this, be saying, oh, it's all in your head, go see a psychiatrist, you know, and that's just uncool and that's why we're here. So clinical skills, um, what we need to do, what I need to do, what my residents and my trainees need to do is psychiatry, um, family practice, um, you know, all different sorts of folks, anyone who, what I always say about using medicine is if you're going to fly a plane, you got to know how to land it. And so in my opinion, one should not start a benzodiazepine without knowing how to stop it. And it, since we know that benzodiazepines are um, indicated for on a daily basis for four weeks and no more than that, then we should never be prescribing more than four weeks at a time initially. And then if we find someone that is already on benzos and we need to help them decrease it, then we need better tools and um, better, better ability to have a wraparound care system to help folks come off of benzos safely. But we wanna taper quickly. Um, we wanna use motivational interviewing. 
Um, you know, I had someone that I worked with today, another patient I worked with today that we've talked about it for six years getting off of benzos and it's just never the right time. And so I have to use a lot of my motivational interviewing skills to see, to try and help him develop his own discrepancy to make the change because I also am not going to put someone into withdrawal. I'm not going to cut someone off. That's not cool. Um, so we have to do this balance of safety and also um, adherence and, um, and, and initiation. So we also have to manage expectations. Um, so that's why I keep talking about the support. There's peer coaching online. The Ashton Manual is a great place as well. And we need to share the decision-making. I'm not making all the decisions as the prescriber. We're making the decisions as a team. Honestly, the overnight oxygenation studies are so great. And I think that that is gonna be a great tool and should be something that we assess people's ability to oxygenate while sleeping. Um, and um, I wanna make sure that we also take into, we, be, we, we call it benzo wise. We need to be, informed listeners, able to know as providers, oops, sorry, as providers, um, what we can do to listen to folks. Um, the benzodiazepine injury syndrome, it's real. It's not in the DSM. It's not a code of billable code in medicine, um, but it's certainly something that is, is true. And I try and use that in my language because it's also not benzo, benzo addiction, it's not benzo substance use disorder, it's, it's usually benzo injury syndrome and it's not all in your head because it definitely um, has been not psychosomatic for most of the patients. It does come in waves, like we mentioned, waves and windows, periods of increased withdrawal and increased intensity and then decreased withdrawal and decreased intensity. And then we need to know about micro tapering. Um, using dose reductions, smaller and smaller and smaller. And then how do we do it when it, we get down to the smallest pill that we can have cut in a quarter? Go into liquid. How do we do it when we go beyond liquid? Get it uh, compounded from a specialty pharmacy. Some things are a little bit price prohibitive. And so, cause insurance doesn't cover compounded pharmacies. So we have some other tricks that we can do um, which are listed in the Ashton manual. For individuals that are themselves interested in uh, decreasing their benzodiazepine use or stopping or deprescribing, as we say, prepare to engage your prescriber. So talk with your prescriber using some tools. We have some tools on the website, benzoreform.org. And again, these will all be listed available for you on the website. Um, with questions and answers about withdrawal syndrome. Um, we have some tools that are for the prescriber so that if you're, you know, if you know that you're an individual that wants to make a change or wants some help with this and you bring it to your prescriber and your prescriber says, oh, it's all in your head, you can bring some tools that will hopefully help engage them with some scientific data and help compel them if they're not compelled yet to help you. Most people are more and more open to it, thank goodness. Um, so what we're assuming for the rest of this presentation, which is just a handful more slides, is that your prescriber is failing to talk to you about benzodiazepine deprescribing. And so what we want is to be able to help you help get help because that's really a problem. We want your prescriber to be able to give you some good guidance on tapering, or at least, you know, you direct the taper and they acquiesce to helping you um, assess, assess the symptoms and then also give you symptom relief. 